Good afternoon, everyone. We'll get started in just a moment while we allow for a few more people to join the call. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Andrew Sorensen, spokesperson here at CU Boulder. I'll be moderating today's call. Some quick housekeeping items before we get started. Today's webinar is focused on staff and faculty. Next week on Tuesday, April 27th, the campus Q&A will focus on students and families. That will also be our last scheduled campus Q&A of this webinar series. If you have a question for the experts on today's call, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. You can start doing that now. Because this session is focused on faculty and staff, please note we are prioritizing questions from faculty and staff. We will do our best to get to all questions. If we do not get to your question, you can reach out to us at colorado.edu forward slash COVID-19. If by chance we run out of questions prior to the scheduled ending of the webinar, we will end early. And as a reminder, today's call will be recorded and that recording will be available on our COVID-19 website. On today's call, we'll have comments from Catherine Eggert, Senior Vice Provost for Academic Planning and Assessment, Catherine Irwin, Chief Human Resources Officer, Dave Kang, Vice Chancellor for Infrastructure and Sustainability, and Jennifer McDuffie, Associate Vice Chancellor for Health and Wellness and leader of our Campus Pandemic Response Office. I'll now turn it over to Catherine Eggert for some opening comments. Thank you, Andrew. And thanks to all of you for joining us on this call today. With just a little more than a week of classes left in the semester, I want to commend and thank, apologies, but I had my, apologies, having some, some video trouble. So let me start that over. Sorry about that. I, I want to thank everybody this semester for all of their tremendous effort there. Uh, your perseverance, your flexibility, and your commitment as you've been carrying out and supporting the academic mission of teaching and research during this truly extraordinary year. And as we wrap up the semester, we are all now, I know, looking forward to returning to a more traditional in-person academic experience for fall 2021 with the majority of our classes being held in person. Some of our larger lecture classes will continue remotely, as we've said, as we continue to examine the capacity of lecture halls that have theater style seating. And we've also asked departments to offer some other types of classes in remote options because many students reported this year that they preferred having the option for a remote instruction mode. For faculty and staff, or excuse me, for faculty and students, uh, due to the availability of vaccines, we're going to be returning to normal practice for those who need an accommodation for teaching and learning. So faculty members who have a medical need or a family need for accommodation or for leave will return to the practice for faculty of using FMLA leave or requesting ADA accommodation. For students, if there's a student who needs an accommodation for the classroom for medical reasons or any other documented disability, that student will work with disability services to document that need. And it's important to note that this accommodation will be made only for students with documented disabilities, which will include medical conditions. If a student for whatever other reason besides a documented disability, has come to prefer an online class, they should seek an online section. If none's available, they'll need to attend the in-person class. And now I'd like to turn it over to Catherine Irwin. 
Thank you, Catherine. And I just want to um, echo the sentiments that you expressed in thanking um, everyone on campus, faculty and staff for your efforts over the past year. It really has been collectively extraordinary. Uh, and I've had a unique lens in being able to see that as the Chief Human Resources Officer. So I just want to really extend a sincere thank you. Um, <clears throat> today, I'd like to talk about plans for staffing this summer and fall. In a moment, you will hear from David Kang and Jennifer McDuffie on the anticipated reduction in restrictions related to COVID-19 beginning late spring and early summer. This reduction in restrictions means that there will likely not be public health reasons for mandating remote working. We also know that by summer, all staff and faculty will have the opportunity to be vaccinated. Human resources, along with our partners, are planning guidance for staffing this summer and fall that recognizes staff can now work in the environment that best supports their work and the work of their unit. This means some employees will return to campus, some employees will continue to work remotely, and some employees will have hybrid work arrangements. We have learned many lessons from the pandemic about the ability to work productively and successfully in a remote environment. We also recognize the importance of our presence on campus in creating a sense of community and in creating the best possible student experience. And we're applying both of these lessons as we prepare for summer and fall staffing. HR will issue guidance this week to university officers and their managers to assist them in determining the best work arrangements for summer and fall staffing. We will encourage careful planning and flexibility as we transition into our new work environment, recognizing especially that staff may still have challenges with childcare or elder care in these next few months. So for now, staff should continue in your same work, working environment, knowing that your leadership will be planning for the best post-pandemic work arrangement for you and your department beginning this summer. For more information on this, you can contact colorado.edu forward slash HR. And now I'd like to turn it over to David King. Hey, thank you, Catherine, and, and good afternoon. Happy to be here and appreciate everyone who has joined us on this call today. With so many changes occurring related to restrictions and the COVID-19 dial shifting to county control, our facilities task force continues to assess what these changes mean for facilities and our approach to fall. As we look ahead to summer sessions, we do anticipate that there will be fewer restrictions on building access as the restrictions on the dial loosen, and we will share an update when we get those details finalized. We also know, as I mentioned two weeks ago, that we will continue our enhanced cleaning protocols and HVAC measures going into this fall. However, I wanna to continue to emphasize how important it is that our employees get vaccines when they get the opportunity. While we've had great success in preventing transmission in our classrooms with the mitigation measures we've had in place in all our campus buildings over the past year, the vaccines will provide greater protection than any facilities intervention we can take. So I really encourage all of our facility staff and other employees to get vaccinated. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jennifer McDuffie. Jennifer? Thank you, Dave. Um, as we look towards the summer and the fall, we're expecting continued reduction in restrictions around the COVID-19 virus. Last Friday, April 16th, Boulder County shifted to level blue on the dial. We will remain there until at least May 16th, unless there is a significant increase in hospitalizations. While we may not have the requirements and restrictions we are still recommending that we practice good public health mitigation strategies. That includes masking. It is still required indoors to have a mask in public spaces. It also includes hand washing and hygiene. Distancing is very important, especially if you are meeting with people who aren't in your immediate household. And above all else, I think it's really important to see if you can get the vaccine. 
we have to do our part as we still have vulnerable populations um, that are able to um, be protected as long as we continue to support these mitigation strategies. The other thing that I wanna encourage us all to do is if you have not been able to get the vaccine, please go online. We do have vaccines available here on campus and we also have resources available to help support the vaccine endeavors. We are very excited to talk more about what it means this summer and fall and how to have a really strong end to the spring semester. Thank you for all of your support of our campus community and please continue to do your part in keeping us safe. And now I'll turn it back over to Andrew. Thank you and uh, thank you to all of our panelists today. At this time, we'll invite our audience to ask your questions. Again, if you have a question, please use that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. First up, a question for Jennifer McDuffie or Katherine Eggert. Given how quickly CU switched from in-person teaching to remote last spring, what's standing in the way of CU switching quickly back to in-person when, as expected, the county goes to level clear May 15th? Why is there not urgency behind the mental health of young undergrads who are most greatly impacted by the impact of isolation? Well, I will speak to the, um, the classroom instruction modes and I'll turn it over to Jennifer to talk about uh, our care for our students' mental health. So uh, we have students registering for classes now and uh, a, a small percentage of them, 19% are offered remote or online. Students who are registering for remote or online classes are entitled to receive the class in the mode that they uh, signed up for. Uh, and it's a truth in advertising thing. We're required to do that by our accreditors and all kinds of other um, uh, policies. So, uh, so those classes will remain remote or online as listed. As the summer goes along, and if we have clear guidance from our uh, scientific experts and from uh, our public health authorities, we will uh, explore opportunities to expand our in-person class capacity. And the only thing I would add to that um, is to emphasize what Catherine just said. We heard from many stakeholders, parents, students, faculty, staff, that switching modalities was really disruptive. And our hope is that we can provide enough guidance and enough timing so that that disruption um, isn't as significant as it was when we had to unfortunately switch to remote learning. All right, thank you. Uh, Jennifer McDuffie, we're going to stay with you for a two-part question here. Will testing be required of both on and off campus students going forward? And then the second question here, will the campus continue providing case investigation and contact tracing? Thank you, Andrew. Um, for the spring semester, um, there's still a couple of weeks left. We do require testing, surveillance and monitoring weekly um, for any person who's going to be on campus and for students who are living in the residential communities, as well as for faculty and staff. Um, I will say that as we look to the summer months, we do have a scaled down version of testing. Um, and what that means is with our campus really getting a lot quieter, we won't need the seven different locations um, that we had. So we will be offering three sites over the summer for testing. We encourage anyone to do it, but it will not be required over the summer. The other piece that we are going to continue is case investigation and contact tracing. In fact, in uh, March, we actually um, found that we were able to resolve all cases within 24 hours and 80% of cases were contacted within 12. That's key. It allows for us to really put our efforts towards um, reducing spread, providing public health measures, but also medical guidance um, to ensure that people are monitoring symptoms. All right, thank you. A question for Katherine Eggert here. What percent of undergrad teaching hours 
are the large lectures that are currently planned to remain remote in the fall? I don't have that information in my head, uh, but I will say that it's our, our, our very largest lecture classes, so 225 or over, will, are, are all um, remote or online. Those are a very small percentage of our uh, teaching hours, though, because um, we, we ordinarily don't offer such uh, too many such huge lecture classes. Uh, so um, we are uh, for our uh, what we call medium large classes between 100 and 224. We are um, we have a mix of those uh, both in person and remote. Thank you. A uh, question here for Dave Kang and Jennifer McDuffie. Will campus still require buff one card access to access buildings uh, in, on campus in the fall? We're working on the access control protocols right now. Uh, anticipate that in the fall, uh, most buildings will be open during regular business hours and we're determining what those are right now uh, based on the scheduling and then uh, limited access with swipe access in the evenings. And we'll uh, disseminate that information once they're finalized. Jennifer, anything to add there? No, I think that um, one of the benefits that we've worked on with Dave Kang's team um, is our ability to vaccinate, test, um, and really support the campus community has allowed us to get to this point. So very grateful for that. Okay. Uh, and just a reminder, it looks like we're getting several parent questions in the chat. We'll try to get to those time permitting. Uh, however, this is a faculty and staff focused Q&A. And next week is the students and families campus Q&A. Uh, another question for Dave Kang and Jennifer McDuffie here. Will campus still require, oh, sorry. <laughs> I just asked that question. Uh, question for Jennifer McDuffie. Will campus require vaccinations for students, faculty, and staff to be on campus? Other public universities are requiring the vaccine. Yes, that's something that we continue to monitor and have uh, a lot of robust discussions about. Um, we have looked at it from multiple angles. Again, that legal, um, ethical, financial barriers that have come up with the vaccine, the science, um, and hope to have a decision very soon about if it will be required or strongly recommended. I think the important piece to note um, is that currently uh, all three vaccines are in the emergency use authorization, and we're monitoring a lot of the supply chain. If we require something, we wanna make sure that there are no barriers for access, whether that be location specific, financial, um, as well as to offer um, per Colorado law, any exemptions for medical reasons, as well as personal and religious. So it is a very complex question and it's one that we continue to evaluate and hope to have more information on soon. Thank you. Question for student affairs and uh, potentially Jennifer McDuffie here. What's the status of events for fall and reserving large events spaces? How will events be prioritized if more demand, if there's more demand for events out, uh, outside of event spaces, I think is what this person was trying to say. That's a really um, exciting question for us because we're talking about events that we haven't been able to host in you know, a little over a year. So what I can tell you is currently with the level blue restrictions, we are in a place where event management forms can be submitted uh, through the University uh, Memorial Center's events planning and catering team. In order to do um, an event on campus, once you submit that form, it's then reviewed for any public health, for safety, for guidance, and to ensure it follows the guidance that we have of Level Blue. As we look at Level Clear in mid-May, we will be looking at aligning our policies and guidance to support the restrictions. 
And for many of us, we know that that 90 days doesn't have a lot of restrictions. So our teams are working right now to put into place how we can align the event and activities processes um, for that mid-May switch. So I hope to have more information in the next week. Um, and I would look at our CE Boulder Today uh, article, the COVID updates on Thursdays for more information. And reading that again, I, I think that last piece of the question, they were actually asking, what happens if we run out of space? Uh, and I, if you have anything on that. Yeah, um, I think that if I know for the faculty and staff who are on this call, we know that space has always been something that we wish we had more of uh, on campus. And Dave Kang and his team are very creative at problem solving and, and creating spaces. I think one of the things that we're going to look at is what are the protocols that were in place pre-COVID? Um, and some of that is making sure that our priorities align with our academic mission. And then we have to look at if there isn't space available for that specific date and time, how can we work with you to accomplish your goals, either in alternative locations or um, in date changes. So there's multi-tiered ways that we're gonna be able to support the campus as it relates to space. All right, thank you. If I can just add something. Absolutely. Uh, right now we're going through and doing the rooming for the, for the classes. And so that's the priority. And so we have a hold on many of the spaces that were available uh, in the past for these events. And as soon as we get the rooming finalized, uh, to the extent possible, we will um, make those spaces available for scheduling for other activities. All right, thank you. Uh, another question for Jennifer McDuffie here. This person says, I'm curious with the new state and local dial guidelines based mainly on hospitalizations, we'll see you continue to consider number of active COVID cases in determining campus COVID restrictions. With new variants, I wonder if relaxing guidelines too quickly could backfire. A very good question and one that I think many of us are grappling with. Um, and what I mean by that is there's a lot of information right now about variants, about spread, um, but there's also information coming out about um, vulnerable populations as it relates to the variants, as well as, um, that high level of risk, hospitalization and death. One of the things that I would um, offer is that as we look at um, this new phased approach of level clear for 90 days, the state and county are focused on hospitalizations, but we continue to assess how our campus and how our community is doing. And by that, we're offering still testing that is free. We're also offering that not just to our CU community, but our household and family members, because we know the importance of that. We're also offering our buff pass, um, which allows for symptom tracking and gives guidance. We worked really hard to ingrain um, this community of care and public health support for one another um, throughout the summer, even when the restrictions aren't in place. So please know that we are very mindful of that and we'll continue to watch multiple metrics, um, but we also wanna make sure that we're aligning with the state um, as well as the local public health orders. Thank you. Question here for Catherine Irwin and Jennifer McDuffie. Both might have some, some parts of the answer here. What requests can faculty and staff make to supervisors and department chairs if they have unvaccinated coworkers that they don't feel comfortable working around? Maybe I'll start that. Um, I think if they have concerns about that, they should go to their uh, chair or to their supervisor um, with that concern. Beyond that, Jennifer, I'm going to let, let you finish the answer. I think, uh, uh, can you hear me? Okay. I think a few points that I would make on this is we're at a really interesting time where a large portion of our community is vaccinated, but not all of our community is vaccinated. And there are reasons why certain people aren't vaccinated. 
medical reasons, um, as well as personal and religious. So our hope is that as we look at returning to campus, as we look at being in more in-person spaces, that we can continue to um, use those public health uh, recommendations. So for example, I was in the office last week. Um, I am very careful to make sure that I'm keeping distancing. I'm monitoring my symptoms before coming to campus because it's been a year of doing that and I, I find it part of my morning routine. And I'm also paying really close attention to those who are around me. Um, masking, like I said, is still required indoors, but what I'm finding is that I will probably, uh, like many of us, wear a mask even after it's not required in certain places and spaces. So I think part of this is making sure we're doing our part. I think the other piece is for many of us, we know that we're part of something bigger than ourselves. And we've learned a lot about hand sanitizer. We've learned a lot about cleaning and other pieces. And I think that now, as we look at hotter months in the summer, as we look at reduced spread and plateauing in many communities, and as we look at the increased vaccination population, it's now time to dip our toes into the water, if you will, and see how we can safely um, and psychologically well return um, to what is, you know, our campus community and being part of something bigger than ourselves. Thank you. A uh, question here for Catherine Irwin. What's the status of the data breach from January 25th? What's the resolution? So uh, let me just start by saying that our Associate Vice Chancellor Dan Jones, who is our cybersecurity expert, is not on the call today. Um, so I will tell you what I do know um, regarding the data, data breach. Um, letters have been sent to notify all individuals who had personally identifiable information contained in the breach files. And the letters mention offering credit monitoring or identity monitoring um, as being made available to impacted employees who want that. There is a website, um, and I will, I will tell you what it is, but I think we can also um, put it in the chat for you. It is uh, www.edu forward slash Accelion, A-C-C-E-L-L-I-O-N hyphen cyber attack. And that's what I have to share uh, right now, but I think on that website, you'll find um, good additional information. Okay, so cu.edu slash Excelion hyphen cyber attack. Is that right? You got it. Okay. Uh, another question here for Jennifer McDuffie. If Boulder gets rid of the mask mandate, is campus considering following their lead or will campus impose their own mandates? I think that's a really good question and one that we've been consulting our scientific steering committee um, and the facilities task force. I think that there are certain places and spaces where mask wearing may be a common practice. Um, and then there are others where it may not make, um, where it may not be a requirement. What I can say at this point is we would follow um, all guidance related to any restrictions or regulations. I'd also say that in certain situations, masking could be recommended. Um, and I think we talked about this earlier. I'm not trying to be vague or confusing, but I do think in many cases, it's important to um, wear a mask. You know, For example, if you're feeling not well, but you want to run errands or leave the house, that may be a time and place for that. Um, but at the same time, I think it's really important that as we recognize that the pandemic has shifted into this new phase, that many of us um, will be vaccinated, many of us will have the antibodies built, and many of us will need to continue um, to support those public health efforts, even if they're not required. Thank you. 
Uh, question here uh, again, another Jennifer McDuffie and possibly Dave Kang question. What are the anticipated faculty staff requirements for in person meetings over the summer? Distancing and masks, square footage of spaces, what should people be considering? Dave Kang uh, alluded to this earlier. So if you don't mind, I may share it with him as his task force has been working very hard on this. Absolutely. You know, we, we would consider uh, the summer to be that transition period kind of going into the fall. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we're learning uh, and maybe relearning. Uh, how do we interact with each other with the technology? So there is going to be a lot of, I think, um, work that we're going to have to do to figure out what is that new norm as we start returning to, to work. Uh, as, as we talked about, uh, the density reductions, the, the social distancing, uh, the masking, these are all changes that uh, we're going to have to get accustomed to. And I think the summer will be a good opportunity for us to transition that into, into that, especially as we move into fall. All right, thank you. Uh, another question for Jennifer McDuffie. Does the university anticipate having enough vaccine supply in the fall for everyone who still needs and wants it? As long as there is a supply, we will continue to vaccinate. And what I can share with you, Andrew, I'm, I'm actually really humbled by this. Um, I was able to meet with the team yesterday and we pulled some numbers and we have provided a substantial amount of vaccines to our CU Boulder community and anticipate um, having over 9,000 people who've received at least a first dose. Uh, by the end of next week. So we are doing everything that we can uh, to support the community and we'll continue over the summer and into the fall as we either have new or returning students, faculty and staff. Thank you and we'll stay with you for another question here. Are there plans to continue the vaccine clinic, clinic over at the SEEK building this fall? Also will the campus be able to provide PCR testing for dependents in the future? I'm so excited about that question um, for multiple reasons, but I, I wanna say to whomever may be on the call from the SEEK community, how grateful we have been for your support. Um, they have allowed us to use this space in a unique way and parking and others have provided just such wraparound services for a very efficient, safe, um, and just equitable experience for all. Our hope is that once we get through the mass vaccinations um, clinics this spring, that we would then move operations as appropriately to either Wardenburg um, or through a mobile type of operation. So while I don't know if we will be at SEEK like we have been uh, this spring, I do know that vaccines will be on the campus. To the second question about PCR tests um, for dependents, that is something that we are looking into, but one of the things that we've really tried to prioritize and will continue to prioritize is supporting our CU faculty, staff, and students. And some of the challenges when we talk about dependents or immediate uh, family or households is there's only so much of that wraparound service we can offer. And so it's not just about the PCR, it's about the case investigation and, and, and so on. So we wanna make sure that we don't make those decisions uh, that have negative implications or impacts to other processes. So something that we're reviewing at this time, we are not offering it, um, but it, should we offer it, we will definitely let the campus know. All right, and a question here for Catherine Irwin and potentially Jennifer McDuffie as well. Do faculty and staff have to disclose if they're vaccinated upon returning to campus? Also, why is asking someone's vaccine status not a HIPAA violation? So generally speaking, you know, employees medical information is confidential information and vaccinations would fall into that category. 
um, under current and existing law as being um, private medical information that does not need to be shared with the employer. Now it's conceivable that federal guidance will change on this particular issue around vaccines, but as far as we know right now and, and the current state of, of the law is that um, there is no requirement to disclose for faculty and staff at this time. And Jennifer, would you like to add to that? I think that you said it very well. I think it's really important, especially as we enter into this new phase um, that everyone is offered options um, for appointments, offered information, but they're not being asked to disclose any information. And I think that that's gonna be very critical as there are multiple um, situations where the best of intent uh, may not be translated to a question like that. And we wanna protect one another's privacy. Thank you. Uh, question here, I think uh, potentially for Jennifer, the pandemic has caused mental health issues for many. What accommodations for faculty and staff will be allowed for those struggling with reintegration, returning to public life? What can supervisors and department heads do to deal with people who need the time for this readjustment? And I'm gonna reach out, Andrew, um, and provide just a few items, but I wanna be really honest and invite Catherine Irwin into this space. Um, Catherine Irwin oversees our faculty staff assistance program that supports uh, mental health for faculty and staff. I will tell you that we are seeing um, both in the Office of Victim Assistance with faculty and staff, um, as well as in our own teams, a very significant um, gap around coming either back to campus, uh, coming into Boulder, or just anxiety with change. I think many of us are feeling the uncertainty um, with so much change happening. And one thing I can tell you is we have incredible resources and people on this campus. And so please know you are never alone. Please reach out to any one of those offices. Um, and we are working at the end um, of, of this, maybe we can post in the chat. We're really working to get some of that skill-based information and learning to folks so that we can start um, not only digesting it, but also practicing it for when we do return, if we've left campus for a bit, or when we can um, actually spend some time focusing on our mental health and wellness. Catherine, I know, has probably a lot more great information to share. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, actually, I think I have uh, complimentary information to share. So Jennifer really talked about the wealth of resources that we have on campus. Um, to help people who are, are uh, struggling with anxiety or mental health issues or any issues related to returning. What I want to add to that is in the guidance, you know, I talked earlier in my introductory comments about the guidance that we're providing to supervisors and um, leaders across campus. In that guidance is, it, it includes a section on um, really allowing, particularly this summer and fall, for flexibility, whether it's related to people having anxiety about returning or related to um, child care, elder care uh, issues that are making it difficult for them to easily return or um, to change their modality of work, you know, uh, quickly. So we are expecting and encouraging much flexibility and um, support from leadership and, and supervisors in um, supporting, in meeting their employees' needs around these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question, well, I believe that is the end of our faculty and staff questions for now. So we'll transition to some parent student questions. And here's one for Katherine Eggert. This person asks, why are some of the 100 to 250 person sized lectures still allowed to be remote and some not with widely known uh, impacts of isolation 
being felt by younger adults like undergrads and these kinds of courses being a large proportion of their courses? So first I'll start with what seems uh, to be the underlying basis of that question for, from the, the last part of the question. It seems this person has experience with a student who is not getting the kinds of in-person courses that they want. So that student um, should be in touch with their academic advisor to um, see if there are al alternative courses or alternative ways of arranging their schedule so that they can get more in-person courses. Um, and I am also happy to help um, navigate some of those avenues if, if uh, anyone uh, wants to email me with a particular problem. Um, so again, we have these, what we call medium large lecture classes of uh, 100 and uh, up, up to 224. And we are offering so, um, many of those classes in person because our classrooms are big enough to accommodate them. We are offering a number of them remote. Uh, what we learned this year is that uh, many students prefer having a remote option. So we want to make some of those remote options available to students. We are seeing very robust enrollments in remote sections, I have to say, um, even more than in person uh, for, um, for students who have, or who have been registering for the last week or so. Um, we also, it's important to note uh, as, a, as a matter of routine, save spaces for our new incoming first year students in, uh, in, in classes. So they won't be disadvantaged by the uh, returning students having crowded them out of, of in-person classes. So, so ha have no fear on that point if you have a student who's coming in for their first year. Wonderful, thank you. A uh, question for student affairs professionals who are on the call. This person says, hi, can there be a goodwill truck or something available for on-campus students to make donations during move out? Thanks. I love that question. Um, and I believe I just, I need to check with this, but I believe April 12th, um, some of these donation stations actually started. And so outside residence halls, um, it's a great partnership with our environmental center on campus. Um, they will allow you to donate non-perishable items, um, hygiene products, anything that's, um, not opened obviously as it relates to some of those but gently used items unfortunately with the pandemic they're not able to um, donate the soft items like pillows and mattresses and things that they used to but we absolutely encourage anyone who is moving out to please contribute we have um, ample staff that will be available during move out um, and really want to support our larger community by doing that. So whoever asked that question, thank you. Um, and I can also put a plug in. I know our student affairs colleagues are also doing a mobile food pantry today. And we have a lot of basic needs that our students and our faculty and staff uh, get supported through. So please do donate and contribute. Wonderful. Thank you. A uh, question here for Catherine Eggert. This person is wondering, when will the Rustandi study rooms in the facilities will be made available for use? They say students could really use those for finals prep. Yeah, so the references for those who don't know is to the new extension that reaches and in between and joins the uh, Leeds uh, School of Business to the College of Engineering. And depending on what, what room, uh, the student would need to uh, book a room with either leads or engineering. So they should go and talk to the college about booking those rooms. Um, they are not open to the public during the pandemic. All right. And I, I think Catherine will actually stay with you for another question here. This person says their daughter's struggling to finish semester all online in the area of testing. Is there any guidance regarding speaking to their advisor, professors, 
I'm talking about taking a possible incomplete versus a fail in a worst case scenario. How long would she have to hopefully complete the class or do extra work to bring up her test scores? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And um, I'm sorry to the to the daughter who's struggling that um, that's that's rough. Um, yes, incompletes are possible. Uh, the student should talk to their academic advisor to help just run interference with the professors and the advisor will also have the information on what um, the paperwork needs to be done to, to um, sign up for an, an incomplete. Uh, the um, in, instructor then will set uh, requirements for how, what needs to, what remains to be done and uh, the deadlines for the students. Um, it depends on the college, the school, and the sometimes even the individual professor. You can have up to a year uh, in some cases to complete an incomplete. But speaking as a, a longtime professor, I would urge anybody who takes an incomplete to finish as soon as possible because you're not going to want to do it a year from now. Sure. Thank you. A uh, question for a student affairs expert. This person's wondering, where can I find information about requirements and guidelines for hosting CU events off campus? Let me look. Um, I believe the um, website is through risk management and it is www.cu dot edu forward slash risk forward slash off dash campus dash activities and just to let you know this website is really um, helpful at providing guidance um, information and waivers should you be an affiliated student group or a department who's interested in doing something, um, as well as other helpful tips around um, what to look for, what to expect. So definitely uh, utilize this website and when in doubt, please reach out to that office. All right, thank you. And I believe that will be our last question for today. Next week on Tuesday, April 27th, the campus Q&A will focus on students and families. That will be our last scheduled campus Q&A of this series. We're excited to be joined by Chancellor DiStefano, Provost Moore, and COO Pat O'Rourke. Moving forward, we'll have these uh, campus Q&As as one-off or town halls as needed. If you have more questions or would like to see additional information, you can do so by visiting our COVID-19 website. Again, that's colorado.edu forward slash COVID-19. There you'll find a chat at the bottom right-hand corner where you can ask questions. Thank you all for joining us today, and we will now end the call.